And Serena, thank you for the introduction. And um, and I'm excited to be here and talking to all of you about this subject. It's something I think about a lot in the context of my dissertation and also the world of my life. My life. And something that touches all of our lives as well. So I'm really excited to get to the discussion portion uh, to hear about your perspectives and your experiences. Because what excites me about this is I think there's a lot we know about money, how it affects, affects our society, our, uh, our psychology, and there's been a lot of interesting experiments around this. But I bet you all have some ideas, experiences, and examples you know of that could make for a really rich discussion. So, money, right? Um, we taught me, we knew about since we were little, right? I remember my grandfather trying to instill the value of money in my life from an early age, saving piggy banks. Um, if my parents had more money, I'd like to think they'd fight a lot less, or so it seems growing up. Um, so it kind of it creates this sense of we have respect for it and a reverence for it. We have a need for it, a longing for it. Um, we memorialize our great leaders and presidents and our great national monuments, right, on our bills. Um, and at the same time, it has a, a dark side as well, right? <laughs> so in some ways, um, there's this view that money is uh, the root of all evil, and there's been, multiple, there's been multiple attempts in Western society to build moneyless societies as well, right? If you think about um, even monks or ascetics in um, Hindu or Buddhist countries, those, you know, you give up all the money, all your worldly possessions, and then finally you can be in this fast path towards awakening, union with the divine, whatever you want to call it, but leaving the dark drudgery of this world for something higher. Um, so there's good things to money, there's bad things to not money. Um, this is a quote by um, a sociologist, which I think really speaks also to the neutrality of money. You know, in some ways money is like the atom, the quark, the electron that underpins our society. It's a long quote, but it's the most poetic, academic statement I've seen about money. It, so uh, the, the argument he's made that um, Sybil's making is money is neutral, money is indifferent, money is ambivalent. You know, and Marx and Weber and other great sociologists have made similar arguments as well. At best, money is neutral. I'll read the last two sentences fairly like that. All things float with equal, specific gravity in a constant moving stream of money. All things lie on the same level and differ from one another only in the size of the area that they cover. So it is like a common denominator. Right? And it's, it's really practical when you think about it too, relative to bartering other systems as well. There's a neutrality to it. What is there? What? <laughs> um, so um, in this talk, I want to cover the social psychology of money and really explore these different dimensions. How is money um, impacting our brain? What do we know about? what parts of our brain or what aspects of our psychology and our behavior are triggered when we see money and how is it influencing our society. Um, and as a starting point, I actually want to look at a society perhaps most familiar to us here in San Francisco that I just came back from a week or so ago um, that is moneyless, which is Burning Man. Right? And so Burning Man is an interesting experiment in the sense that it is, it's moneyless. And it's not even a bartering economy, as some people think it is. It's a, it's a gift economy. How, and how many people here have been to Burning Man? Okay, it's about half the room, majority of the room. So we can talk more about Burning Man in the context of this later. But it's a really interesting example, I think, of um, a world, and a temporary world that exists and functions without um, any currency without any expectation of reciprocity. So social scientists call that generalized exchange system in the sense that I will give something to Zarina, Zarina will give something to Eric, Eric will give something to a random stranger in this room, and somehow, someday, I may get something back. Or maybe not, and I'm okay with that. So those instances are really rare, but that's what a gift economy is, and that's what Burning Man is an example of. Um, I thought this was a really nice quote Bur uh, from Burning Man. Burning Man is devoted to the act of giving. The value of gift is unconditional. Gift gifting does not contemplate a return or an exchange for something of equal value. And so another way of potentially looking at this conversation is um, how can we change 
we look at a moneyless society, we see a lot, I, I found a lot of benefits to birding, and I feel like I see, and many times I've seen the goodness of human nature, the highest human potential, love, generosity, open heartedness, all those things. And I think in the absence of money, I will argue has something to do with that. So another way to think about the stock is how can we feel a little bit more like burning in a practical way? You know, if we want to be normative or practical about it. And I'm gonna um, actually break down money into two components that even academics rarely distinguish between, but I found really important in how I think about this. And one is the system of money. Right. So currency. So so I talk about a gift economy, generalized exchange, where I give to you, you give to someone else. We talk about bartering. There's different tax systems, which is I give something, I buy Zarina a drink today, she buys me a drink next week, right? But m money is this, this neutrality that Simo was talking about, right? So there's a system and the structure of what money looks like and what it enables, right? This neutral currency. Then there's the idea of money in our society and in the Society of Jesus, which led to the, the New Testament quote, and in many other societies as well. But what money means to us psychologically outside of how it plays out in the world. And the first thing I want to talk about is experiment with the system of money, right? So what happens when we try to scale things like the gift economy? Um, so there are examples like that in our day-to-day -day life in small ways, right? So think of like Secret Santa, you know, once a year we get to other friends or colleagues and we give the gift to someone, someone gives a gift to someone else, and you know, if it's all anonymous and it remains anonymous, it doesn't really matter. We can give someone a lump of coal and get I don't know, a really awesome DVD box set or electronic gadget, whatever it is, a, as a gift in return. But what, what happens when you try to create a sustained system, not like a week-long festival, but something that works over the long term? Those examples are more sparse. Um, one instance of that is um, something called free cycle. Where and um, colleagues of mine have studied that. It's a really interesting study where you give away used goods that you don't need anymore to a community. So it's free things that get recycled, like a sofa or a TV or things like that. And someone gives away a TV, and then one day it's a stranger, and then I may get I don't know a desk another day from a stranger. Um, another instance that many of us are familiar with, at least in as uh, we've heard of, is couch surfing. So who here is couch surfed? Smaller group, but a lot. This is a very unique audience. <laughs> we are in the heat in San Francisco. <laughs> um, interestingly, so couch surfing, surfing started in, I believe it's 2003. It's been around for a while. When they launched, they actually launched um, targeting the Burning Man community because they were looking for people who understood this idea of a moneyless gift to kind. You just give to strangers, so it's great to give to strangers and get reward perhaps from that human connection, from giving, etc. And don't really expect anything directly back. Um, though in the past couple of years, couch surfing has had a lot of problems. And a model of this that starts really well has issues scaling, right? And, and issues with sustainability. Um, one is that issues with their business model, they became a for-profit, a lot of their members have lost belief in what couch surfing stands for, the system of giving. Uh, second of all, is actually they found even from the beginning to today that there are some people who give, who are hosts, and some people who receive as guests, but um, there's not that many people who actually give and take. So it's not actually that sort of um, giving and taking you might expect, which creates imbalances in the system. Um, second is people you could argue that the system's got diluted, and so people who've come to it are now just saying because it's cheaper rather than because it's a rather than because they believe in the system. And third is, you know, this idea, there's, a, there's something called the law of reciprocity. The, the deep, something deeply ingrained in human nature is this notion that if I give you something, you give me something in return. And at least anecdotally, um, you know, there are issues in self couch surfing where there are expectations of what you might give to someone and get in return, which has colored the system as it scaled. So it's an interesting model. Um, but actually, you know, looking at it and having colleagues at Stanford who study with with me, it's it's um, I wouldn't say it's it's fully realized its its initial vision versus say an Airbnb out there, right? And we can talk more about that later. I'd love to hear people's stories and hear lots of amazing stories and stories, and also hear stories that are um, not as optimistic for people that as well. So it's a mixed system where you're trying to take this gift economy a model, right? Getting rid of the monetary system and applying that to something like couch surfing, right? Where there really is not much of an economic benefit to doing other than I want to participate, at least as a, a host. Because it 
well, maybe that's because we live in this jaded Western society where money and getting things in return is so deeply ingrained in our way of being that that's the problem. The problem is our culture, our society, our norms, our values. Um, let's look at some traditional societies and get some inspiration from that. And fortunately, a lot of anthropologists have done that for a couple hundred years. And so this is a picture of a potlatch um, gathering or ceremony in the Pacific Northwest. And at Patlatch, um, leaders of tribes from all the region get together and give each other gifts. Which sounds really great. Like, let's all get together as a community, heads of different tribes, rally and give things to one another. Um, the problem is when you actually look at what happens, uh, the actual deeper dynamics of what's going on, a lot of that is um, out-competing one another, right? A lot of this work was done by uh, Marcel Maus and, and other colleagues in anthropology. Um, but So I give a gift to another chief, and then that chief is expected to give me another even bigger, even better gift, and then I have to one-up that chief with an even better, bigger, better gift, more awesome gift, and suddenly you get this vicious cycle where you have um, communities, uh, tribal leaders and tribes that are then suddenly trying to outgift one another, because we're still human beings, we still put out power, we still put out status, right? Um, we're still competitive by nature, and so gifting in that way um, has implications, and of course, if, if someone gives you such a big gift that you can't reciprocate, then you might declare a war or actually respond with some act of violence. And what Mass found is consistently across um, Samoa, the Trubrand, uh, Trubrand Islands in the South Pacific, in France, in ancient India, all these examples of gifting, really his conclusion, and a lot of scholars in this field, Mary Douglas and others have done have looked at this as well, is that there's no such thing as a real gift. Um, which is a little cynical, I'm not sure I hold that view personally, um, at an intimate personal relational level, but when you look at social systems that are built on gifting, they're actually ways of getting needs met, but also to demonstrate power, hierarchy, status, and achieving things you need. And I actually challenge that if you look at some of the dynamics at Burning Man and some of the gift giving there, um, which is not always as anonymous as you want to be, you could see how some of these basic fundamental nature of human, aspects of human nature bleed into the idyllic working in society as well. Um, and there's an academic work done looking at that side as well. So, not to be overly cynical, but to say that, uh, I think some people have argued that, well, the problem with money is we should just all be giving, we should just all be borrowing, we should all be gifting, you know, and there are a number of actually interesting companies in the sharing economy space that I've been talking to that have been trying to, that are trying that. And I love their innovation around that, but if you look at things that are outside these festivals and unique instances or small gatherings of intimate people and families and relations, it's really hard in general to find these gift-giving, generalized exchange systems where they're working or alternatives to currency. You know, when societies find currency and find a way to make currency work, it's really practical and we stick with it. So, but I want to draw that distinction because that's the system of currency, right? Going back to what I was, was talking about earlier. And I want to talk about the idea of money for a second. So what, idea, what money means to us in our society at this moment in time. And is that malleable? So can we have the practicality of, of currency without necessarily the, the baggage and weight of, um, of what money means? And going back to the Birmingham example, I'll talk about my own psychological experience um, last year, where I did something nice for someone. I helped someone out. I don't even remember what it was. It was a blur. But then someone wanted to thank me for whatever I gave him, and so he pulled out a $20 bill and handed it to me. I was like, whoa, like that's not cool. And he kept insisting, trying to be as like, nice and generous as possible, I think it was like his second day there. And I remember observing two reactions in myself. And one was like, I feel like there's something you're violating by bringing, by trying to give me money that undermines what I tried to do for you. That's sort of the system, right? That's the, the currency piece. There's no currency here. There's no reciprocity here. You're violating the system. There's another piece of me that was just mortified by the sight of the money. And like, and my, I, it took me out of my place. It took me out of Berlin. It took me out of the magic. And put me back a little closer to Reno. Right? And then I see this. I was like, I don't want to see that. <laughs> Please flip, get that out of my sight. Like, I don't want the money, but I still want to look at it. Please stop talking about it. And for me, like the worst part every year is you have to buy is going to buy ice and having to find my wallet and 
get out cash and carry change, because it, it does, it takes me out of the experience. Um, and so the second example that I cited is an example of, um, of priming. So priming is a construct in social psychology that um, implies the activation of one psychological, that one, activating one psychological construct changes how we then perceive another psychological construct. And it's not something we're conscious of. It's actually a really cool idea. There's tons of fascinating papers on like how like exposing someone subconsciously, they were not even aware of it to like images of an old man or old woman makes them walk more slowly. Yeah. Right? So there's all these cool examples and all and also there's a lot of um, really depressing work on racism and priming and all of our subconscious biases there. So it's a great field of research and there's actually been a lot of good work done on money as well. So this, the work I want to talk about is actually not my work. It's done by um, Kathleen Bose and colleagues of hers. Um, but they do something really simple. They have you play computer games or they have you fill out surveys or things like that. But in the background, there's a picture on the wall. So I'm sitting at my desk. There's a picture on the wall in front of me or somewhere near me. If you ask me after the fact what was the picture, I'm 95% of people I would conjecture have no idea what the picture was, right? But we have peripheral vision and our mind is taking that information at a subconscious level. And one picture is an image of currency or dollars or dollars floating, and the other is just something neutral. Fish in a tank, flowers, and, you know, and they vary the neutral image to assure that that's not priming something as well. And then they basically do that and see are there any differences in the results. Um, so one example is where they actually gave someone an impossible task. And they said, solve this pu pu puzzle and it can't be solved. And what they found was people wait significantly longer. And they said, here's a period you can ask for help if you want some help with it. What they found is people who are primed with money wait significantly longer to ask for help than people are not primed with the idea of money. Because what was going on there is money's priming self-dependence versus interdependence or relational dependence, right? So something about the idea of money is saying, I need to be, take care of myself. That's what the, the idea of money in our society, right? It has nothing to do with the task or currencies or anything like that. The idea of money is saying, I need to take care of myself and I can't count on others to help me. So they wait a lot longer to ask for help. Or, or might it be that they're trying to hoard? They're trying to what? Hoard. 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 But they don't have to share anything. There's nothing shared as a result of asking for help. So it's, it's, it's a potential hypothesis, but um, there isn't anything. They don't have to share the result by asking for help. It's more of an ego thing. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I'll say for all these studies, there are like more complicated nuances to them, but I'm giving you the, the headlines. And if anyone's interested in the actual papers, I'm happy to send them to you afterwards. Um, and in a different study, I don't know if you all can read that, but, um, but they looked at uh, actually when uh, two people are sitting next to each other, when, uh, when money's prime versus money's not prime, how far is that distance between the chairs? So I have a choice. Do I sit in, so in some studies they'll have a chair one, chair two, chair three. Do I sit next to the person, uh, the stranger? Or do I sit space apart from the stranger? Or you get a bigger chair there, and then they measure, you know, so I walk into and I put down the chair. They measure how far apart you put the chair against the um, confederate or the interviewer, right? And they find significant distance between uh, a fish screen, a blank screen, and then a money screen in terms of, so basically 30 centimeters to, or 30 inches versus you know, 45 or 50 inches, depending on that. So it's really creating a sense of finding social distance. Um, similarly, um, they look at, they ask people if they want to work with another participant, um, less likely to want to work with another participant. Do you want to go on vacation when you're alone or with family and friends? I want to go on vacation alone rather than with family and friends. Um, so money is actually changing it creates social distance. It's finally interdependence. If someone asks you for help or a researcher's like, will you stay next extra couple minutes and help me out with this task? If you've been trying to think of money, you're more likely to say no. Um, in terms of morality, in terms of even how you look at the world, it makes you, it primes a more abstract way of looking at the world. 
versus a more concrete, tangible way of looking at the world. So I look at the world in a more abstract way, a more utilitarian way, a more functional way. Right? So the way just the presence or the idea of money is priming social distance, it's priming more self-dependence, a presumption that you'll be more self-dependent, and more abstract versus uh, concrete, more relational ways of thinking or making sense of things. And all these studies, um, there are some other studies that will ask similar questions, but that's the overarching theme of what all these studies do. All this work has been done in laboratory settings. So you take someone, again, psychology study, I don't know if you've done any of these, done these as undergrads, you walk into a lab and someone sticks you to a computer screen, and it's highly controlled, and which is great for experimental research, but it's really hard to then study a system, right? I can say, do you want to go on vacation by yourself or with friends, yes or no? But that's very different from saying, how do you interact and treat people? What happens at a meta level? So you move up to like, from psychology to sociology, from individuals or paralyzed relationships to communities or systems, that's really hard to study. Um, any questions about this so far? Yes? Mm. So, so the question is, how do you control control for individual differences? So the random fact that someone may just be antisocial in this study. Um, you would, in these sort of studies, you would presume that that you would that would be averaged out as random noise. So if you have uh, 50 people in the study, you might have five antisocial people in group A, seven antisocial or nine antisocial people in group B. Then the statistics would show you, we should use 95% confidence intervals to show that there's a 5% chance is this, is this norm. When you see these little, when you usually see little stars on these studies. Basically the, the threshold is, there's only one in 20 chance that that difference is explained statistically by random noise or difference between the populations versus by the true, the true difference in the population. And for example, those, that difference between the money screen uh, percentage of uh, uh, 10 or 15 versus 80 for the blank or the fish screen, that's huge. So I would say you probably would say, I, I shouldn't say this is an academic, but it, it looks like if I if just looking at that, it's a huge difference. I would guess the odds are much higher than that. So you just have to trust that it's random noise, and that's why you don't study five people or ten people. You find the right population size. Yeah. So um, I guess I'm wondering how your work relates to the stuff of thought Peter lays out. Mm -hmm. This general like, four schema system of like, four basic types of human relationships. So, Kin, reciprocity, uh, The idea of money, and actually Alan Fisk has done a lot of work on this as well, through relational theory. And he suggests four types of relationships, but the two I'm going to talk about are communal sharing, which is kinship, and market pricing, which is really, think about homo -hom economicus, how economists it just it generalize human beings. And so, um, and so like self-interested, and self-interested, calculating, rational, utilitarian, etc and versus kin relationships. And so you could, another way of interpreting this research is money is roughly priming, taking out of a kin-related way of viewing a relationship into a transactional way of looking at a relationship. Right? Even though there may, no, may be nothing to do with money being happening in that moment. Yeah. So that's another way of looking at it. One more question, I'm going to keep moving. Do you know of any research that tries to look for other primes that produce single effects, like uh, algebra screenplays or something? That's a good question. Um, I haven't seen those studies. I would suspect, though, and Alan Fisk's theory would also, the, would also support that, I would suspect that that might get somewhat similar results um, because it's putting in more calculated, rational, utilitarian framing problems. I'm sure you'd be thinking in a more abstract way. I'm not sure if you'd be thinking in a more socially distant way. That would be an interesting thing to study if it hasn't been studied. Can I ask a super similar question? Yeah, sure. Um, do you know if, if any of them put money against uh, 
uh, sort of non-neutral but not priming images. For instance, maybe a, like a more aggressive abstract painting or something like this. <laughs> aggressive with red and, and difficult to yeah. anyways, interpret aggressive how you will. But. So the question was, um, what about looking at money versus abstract images and things like that? Uh, so so did, specifically, like, like a, a red, angry, yeah, vibrant, non-neutral non image. So the thing, the thing about all these studies, and I think it has a limitation, it, well, oh, most of these studies, is they really are trying to compare it to neutrality. Um, what's more complicated, more like the real world, is then seeing, for example, the interaction with, like, how does the red, angry image compare to money, then the interaction effect, if you see both, if they have different effects, you see both how like, the interaction create a whole new effect. Um, those are less common. So I guess related to that, I think people are getting at is, do we know that the picture of money and the picture of flowers are equally balanced? Or what? Equally the picture balanced. of money and the picture of flowers are not equivalent? No, e are they equally balanced? Like, if, you, if you've got people to rate pictures of money and flowers, would, they, would one be negatively balanced or be positively balanced or something like that? Like, uh, you know, like, maybe one is just more attention grabbing than the other. Mm. That's a good question. Uh, I presume that they, they checked for that. Yeah, they did check for that. I mean, these studies are super subtle in that sense, but you can even see they have fish screen, blank screen, money screen, yeah. right? So what they're doing is, at least on this dimension of um, distance between chairs, what they're, they're testing for two things with this, right? Like, is it no image versus, it's blank screen versus money, but then they're saying, well, is it just an image that makes a difference? So when you see the fish screen actually has similar colors, they're having similar colors, similar vibrance, right? Uh, at least if you can see the fish screen image relative to the money screen image. So they're trying to kind of parallel the colors and the abstract art component and control for that, but they also have the blank screen. What they find is no effect for fish screen, which is roughly similar colors and feel. Um, no effect for blank screen and then strong effect for money. So that's how they try to control for it. But these studies are super subtle and having run some like them myself, you have to be really, really careful about what you're activating. And we had a whole, I have another study that I'm doing that I'm not going to talk about where we um, gave people, what's, if there's priming, and what we gave people, we had to pick emoticons or icons, and we debated a long time. First we had animals, I was like, well, I can't have an animal, if someone picks a lion, someone picks a sheep. Am I more likely to trust or be fearful of a person who picked a lion versus a sheep? So we had to throw that out, and then we, we finally picked like, then we had flowers for a while, and then we basically picked abstract patterns because that was uh, the most neutral thing we could find, because we wanted the icon to make it real, kind of like we need the, the flat fish to make it real, but we went through like five variations where we felt like it was truly neutral, and we're still going to test to see, after the fact, did like the pink icon versus the magenta icon activate something, was that for those differently? So, yeah, I, these people did their work well, though, from what I can tell. I'm, I'm going to move on, if that's okay. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about a level up on these psychology studies, your studies on social norms. Um, but another way to think about money is, are the norms activated? Like, and this is part of what happened at Burning Man for me, right? It's like, it's not a norm to use money. So one interesting study, Yeezy um, um, and Rustichini at the bottom did both these studies. They looked at um, paying people a little, paying people a lot, paying people nothing for a task. And they, they basically they had some activity, like, you know, uh, words, unscramble this word and go as long as you can. And they timed how long people dropped out. Um, now they found that um, if you pay people a lot of money, that's when they're the most motivated. If you pay people a reasonable sum of money, they're about equally motivated to paying people to actually not paying anyone at all, saying you do this as a favor for me. The least motivational task is paying people a small amount of money. So suddenly they feel undervalued. And so you're activating a monetary norm. Right versus a relational favor, but you're not doing. But you see, but you're not paying them enough to actually strongly activate the monetary norm. So people are the least motivated in that case. So when you're using money, you have to be careful about it. Another really famous example these these guys looked at um, was at an Israeli daycare center, and this daycare center had a problem of parents arriving late. So they found that. Basically, like parents just show up late, and then and then and they say, "Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry." The the staff would say, "Oh, please try harder next time." You know, it's a bummer because I would love to go home and see my own kids, for example. And then it would move on. So they say, "You know what? Why don't we start ch charging these parents for running late?" They found by charging the parents for running late, significantly more parents were late, and they were later, right? 
Because suddenly you change a social norm, a social contract, like, hey, you're a responsibility to this teacher, to this person, to be there on time, because you're impacting their lives, to a pay-for-service, right? So suddenly, oh, if I'm an hour late and I pay $20, I'm totally fine with that, because I, you know, build X number of minutes at the law office, and that's fine. And so suddenly they change the dynamic of the relationship um, in an unexpected way. So I'm working out from like social psychological research, some interesting social norm research, and now we're moving back to um, um, my own research, which is really getting at, again, the idea of money. So the, the experiment I ran was with a company in the sharing economy site. Um, I'm not going to mention, I've, I've uh, disguised their name, and it's not really relevant to this conversation. But um, in their case, they had, or they innovated their business model a couple of times and settled on a currency of exchange. But then they actually changed the, the name and the symbols behind the currency of exchange halfway into my study. So I have data from before that change and after that change. So basically it's a, a, a site for exchanging who used goods, right? So as an alternative to selling the goods on eBay or borrowing for the goods, so say going to like a clothing swap and hey, I love your sweater, here's like two pairs of pants of mine. It was a way of actually creating some currency to facilitate that and make it easier. Like, you get X number of um, karma points, or whatever you want to call it, you know, or points. We'll use points as a neutral term. You get like 12 points for my sweater, and then I'll pay you six points for your sneakers, right? And so just exchange. One could argue, and, and critics have argued, well, that's not money. That's not, and that, that's just like money. Um, but we'll see if, if that is the case. Uh, so they started with this virtual currency, and they shifted to a dollar-centered system. Um, and so what that meant was they realized that basically they to make the system easier to use and reduce barriers to entry. Because remember, money is neutral. Money is something we all understand. So it's easy, easy to enter a system that shows up with dollar signs. We already have a whole program around that. What they did is they basically recalibrated the currency so it looks so it was closer to the dollar. So you could end. So instead of like 272 points for a U shirt, it might be $27.2 or whatever it might be. And they just and they use a dollar sign. Really basic, the whole system didn't change, it was just a symbol that changed. And and eliminating the need to of complex conversion rates in your head. Uh, and um, these first couple of quotes I'm gonna, um, gonna read out to give you a sense of what this system was like. Um, before the change, because I was really surprised. In some ways, it's it kind of, it's not that different from an eBay business model. But what I started to hear were, something's different about this. So I'll read these aloud. If I post something on eBay, I know the actual doubt of our value in cash. Things posted on good swap are things I'm willing to give away for free. So even if it has that dollar value, I'm sacrificing those dollars for points. Even though I get points, I think I was getting something for free. If I give it to good swap, I can help someone out. It's more of a giving, caring kind of thing. eBay is more of a transaction. Um, it also facilitates really human to human. There's a lot of human to human connection that was happening that really surprised me. So another interviewer, interviewee, um, basically to summarize the quote, I'll, I'll, it's a bit long, um, gave away a voice recorder to someone, or was looking to give away a voice recorder to someone, and took less points to give to someone who had a really good story. It was basically they wanted to record the life story of a relative of theirs. The rel and then they came back and said, not only is this recording my life story, but like two other elder friends of mine as well who were dying of cancer or, or ill. Or, and, um, and basically the conclusion was, wow, this was really worth it for me. Um, I'm happy, very happy to sacrifice those points. Um, the other interesting thing I found was that even in this system where you actually are getting these points back, right? You're getting their cash in your pocket. So there was this perception of giving and wanting to create these back, these these um, symbols around giving and gift giving as well, even though it looks like a normal business transaction. So I put stickers all over the boxes I send. Each active user has figured out how their own trademark things to distinguish their packages. Stickers on boxes are including little cards. I especially include little, ex special little extra gifts or notices for other users I know I've exchanged with before. Um, and what I really found was a really strong qualitative and quantitative evidence of there being a community. 
So I noticed strong solidarity among other active users. We have bonded fairly well, and I've had enough interactions to get a sense that these are fairly kind people. They are generally trustworthy, follow through, and share kind words with each other. So, <laughs> Um, you know, and there's a range. I talked to a lot of people. There's a range of perspectives, but I found it. But there's a lot of people, a fair number of people I talked to, who really saw that embedded in the system, which surprised me. Um, I'm going to now show you some data that that basically compares quantitatively um, findings from the, the active users in this in um, in Good Swap um, before the change and after the change. Um, so what I find, and I'll say that all the data I'm presenting are, all these differences are statistically significant, which means they're not, it's highly unlikely to compare the p-value of less than 0.01 or 0.001 typically. So it's highly unlikely that this is just due to random noise. And actually we're surveying the same people uh, before and afterwards as well, so that each person serves with their own control, if that makes sense. So it's a change in my attitudes between November and December. Um, so what we find is that the view community has significantly changed, right? So on a five-point scale, 4.3 out of 5 is pretty high. We see a drop in community perceptions of warmth, how cooperative things are, how generous people are, and how close-knit they feel the ties are. Yeah? Sorry, are these survey results? They are survey results. Is there, a, is, there a, is there an order effect? Is there a what? An order effect. An order effect? Yeah, like may, maybe everybody tests for the second time, so the, the question is, um, was there left was there a perception of less community over time just because what would the yeah, hypothesis so, argument be? So I guess the null would be like something like uh, uh, anybody who was subjected to the second round of testing was going to would, would, would show less community warmth and cooperation just for the fact that they would be tested for the second time. You know, like like, I guess were they randomized orders? Um, the orders of we had like we had like maybe a, a bunch of other attributes in there as well. Uh -huh. um, some of them uh, like uh, how some of them didn't change as much. Mm. Um, it's hard to know. But it's so hard to control for community. But, sorry, sorry. My question is: Was everybody in November test, uh, given the like um, virtual currency first? Was everyone giving the virtual currency first and then the dollar symbol second? Yeah, everyone everyone's giving the virtual currency first and the yeah. dollar second. There's no reverse order. Um, and actually that was how the system the whole system, the whole platform changed, if that makes sense. So the plat so I have it's possible. Yeah. It's possible that just taking the survey again you answer lower um, consistently. It's possible the other thing that I can't control for is it's possible that if you've been on a member of the site for two years and you know, six months versus two years and nine months, you may just see a decline, but the declines are pretty significant. Yeah. Um, you could argue maybe the seasonal effects or changes out there in the world, and those are things that I can't control for. But in terms of a, a, a field experiment, yeah. it's yeah, there's, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to say anything definitively. Yeah. But aren't November and January kind of charged months? Like November's like Thanksgiving. And there's like a, can be a general sense of happiness and excitement versus like a New Year's. I don't know. <laughs> not to, I'm not. I'm not looking at your like. No one else excited about New Year's. <laughs> I think that's totally. I mean, the experiment happened yeah. between early November and the end of January. So yes, you have like things. It was before. I mean, it was early November, so it was before Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yeah. But you know, end of January, after the whole Christmas wave has gone through, you could argue, may, are people less happy? Maybe, maybe it's snowing a lot. But the sense of community, of trust, of uh, community um, cooperation, generosity could be impacted. It's hard to say. Um, it, it's hard to control for that. I think with trust, the findings are a bit stronger. Um, I don't show these data, but we we ask like we ask questions around general trust. So how how likely are you to trust? an American, a stranger, et cetera, people out there in the world, and we find no change in general trust. Mm -hmm. And yet we do find a, a significant change in trust for members of the site and belief that people fall through their commitments, as well as um, the organization. So for me, that it's easier to ask about general trust. That, that's one case where we actually, actually in my analysis, I do 
a benchmark and calibrate these data to the general trust. So how much you trust uses a good swap relative to the typical American. And we do see a significant difference there. So that, that I think, is a better control. Um, and do you recall, um, are these the lower numbers after the change to uh, dollar-based currency, is that still significantly higher than the general trust? Do you remember where that... Where um, that they are still higher than the general trust. Okay. They're still something higher than the general trust. Yeah. General trust was around 4.1, 4.2. Easy to engage with. 
because suddenly you don't have this bizarre currency and this bizarre system and you're not figuring out like, how much is this shirt worth in your weird point karma things. You're like, oh, ten dollars. That's how much I would expect to pay for a shirt, but those ten dollars can't be spent in the market, they can only be spent on other goods within the site. I can figure that much out and it became much more accessible. So the new so I my the way I'm making sense of what happened now is this sort of trade-off, right? Like you, you have to actually distance yourself from the market, distance yourself from the dollar, distance yourself from um, the idea of money and, and our system out there in the world, right? Which is why some people drive God knows how to be 20 hours this year for us to get to Black Oak City and put all these costumes and rituals in the sand and whatever. And, you know, there are a lot of other, it's not, there are a lot of festivals and activities like that, right? Or you can imagine the ritual and the costumes and the colors of Christmas Day with family having a similar meaning to distance yourself from the market. Um, and that lets you activate this, this idea you were talking about of, of community, of kinship, of something different, of other ways of giving. But also makes it hard to break in. You gotta be a member, and you have to break in sort of and show your stripes in some way. That's made out this community as well to, to get that buy-in. And um, it's harder for new people to make sense of what's going on, because they don't understand the currency, what it means, these rituals. I mean, someone throws little stickers on my box when I get a package, just, and I'm a first time user, I don't know if I'm supposed to give stickers back when I give a box away, right? It takes time. So this, I think there's a trade-off between we try to do things in this world, in this marketplace, the business models between that community dimension and the scalability and accessibility. At least that's where I am on my research right now. Um, how are we on time? Is there enough? Good. Yeah. Good? Okay. I only have a couple more slides and we can open discussion. Um, just some ideas I want to put out there, though, is um, there's a uh, uh, Professor Zelzer out of Princeton, she's done some really interesting research on the idea of special monies. And if you look at other societies or cultures, even the US in the 1800s, there have been these different types of sub currencies, alternative currencies, or different meanings given to money um, that are different from mainstream currency. And I think that's part of what happened with good swaps, is that they, because the dollar existed, they could be an alternative to the dollar, right? Because these were, uh, because these are from, and so they could differentiate and segment themselves away from the main marketplace. You have know, these tribal societies where women are given special money. They will use a lot to use that money only for certain types of things or other things, right? Or even in you know India, where dowry money might have a different meaning or use of purpose than money earned from your day-to-day -day work or labor. So I think there's this interesting idea that's been shown in anthropology and even work in Western societies um, on the idea that there's these special monies like like. Um, different types of shells, whatever it may be, they have different meaning and social meaning and purpose. So there's a way to construe meaning and purpose and non-neutrality to monies in the right way. Right? And I think that's an interesting idea we can think about playing with here in the United States today. And then of course, there's research on alternative currencies, right? So just in the Bay Area, we have Bay Bucks, we have Air Bucks, we have Berkeley Brett, Sam Dollars, and Bolinas, you know, Sonoma County has their own money. Um, and I know, I think we, this, some people in this group have talked about these ideas of alternative currencies before. Um, and they're really interesting, you know, what I've read in terms of academic papers I've studied them is they don't really take off. Um, and the question is, why haven't they take off, taken off, right? Um, are, they're less practical. But I would ask, are they actually doing a good enough job Construing the meaning, the purpose, the reason, the community, the bonds. You know, are they, do they have they done enough work, or do they meet that need around the community ties well enough? And maybe they don't have to scale. Well, I think it's an interesting case as well to study. Where, from what I have read, not many have taken off. But I'd love to hear counter examples and bring that into the discussion as well. Um, so that's it. So the question really is: We have all these other models out there in anthropology in our own day-to-day -day lives and in organizations that we're with, what can we learn? Uh, what can we learn from those and bring into our, our day to day societies as well? And, um, and particularly, I, you know, I share a lot on the psychological influence of money. How does it influence your personal choices? How does it influence how you bring, I mean, just bring it home to ourselves uh, when we leave the store? How we bring, whether we pay for a friend or not, whether we cook at dinner or not. Um, how we think it went, um, are there ways we can avoid is it better if we should try to find ways to avoid talking about money or alternate ways to talk about money 
and does that benefit for relationships more or not, or does it not matter in our society? So how is this research, how, how can that be used to improve our personal relationships? Um, and also business models or business choices. There's a lot of interesting business models out there that are, are working with this um, and that are using currencies and money in different ways. Um, and then, you know, there's this distinction between currencies versus dollars and this idea that that resonate and I'm curious what people think of that and how that might apply to things like alternative currency. So that's all I have to say.
money, this concept of money and currency maybe lets us feel more independent. And so then how does that work in a domestic partnership where the money is either shared, not shared, split apart, and if you do anything about research in sort of more intimate, very specific relationships in terms of these concepts? I think that's a really interesting question. So the question is, how does the money play out in terms of relationships and being, inter being independent versus interdependent financially? Um, I'm sure there's research on that. I'm sure there's more, there's room for more research on that. I'd be curious what, I, I actually, it's just not my field, so I haven't looked at those studies. I'd be curious what your hypothesis is. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm comfortable with you sharing your ideas. <laughs> I guess that uh, Well, um, so my, my, just off the top of my head, my background in sort of feminist theory would indicate that there's probably an exchange of two types of currency happening. Mm -hmm. That So there's this currency of service. Um, so women's, un traditionally women's unpaid work with the currency, actual currency, but also I've seen a lot of different ways long-term domestic partners are sharing money um, currently, and I, I, I would guess that that has some rootedness in how the money affects the relationship itself. Yeah, I'm sure it does, and I could, I could conjecture, but I don't know what qualified the you to conjecture. Um, but I think it's, it's a fascinating question, and I'm sure it does play out. I would argue that um, the interdependence one thing I would I would have about is interdependence does breed more intimacy. Yeah. Is there anything? Um, uh, I wanted to bring up the idea of uh, sorry uh, of uh, time being the ultimate currency. Actually, uh, something you can't like store or hoard, but it, like the thing that uh, sort of underlies everything probably. And I think you were sort of touching on the idea of like service as a as a as a different form of currency. And I wondered whether people have looked at um, gifting of time. Oh, yeah. Time republic. 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 Time 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 Gifting is yeah. So what they, um, there's also been research by Jennifer Ocker at Stanford and one of her graduate students who kind of tenure track back to position of work since that work served her well. Um, <laughs> but it's, um, it's it's good research comparing um, happiness from time versus money. Right. And um, it basically, I forget the details of the research, but investing in time versus investing in money makes us happier and perceive things better. Right. It's, it's generally, um, I forget what the dependent variables are, but they're positive, happy, good things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that's actually a really, uh, the time piece is really interesting because that's, that's relatively recent research and there's a pretty clear finding. Just sort of, sorry, directly building on that real quickly, this, this, this would be a really fascinating one to look at. Time banks use, their, their, uh, their name for it is time dollars, but the currency is ours. Oh. So, so it's, uh, I worked on this, site for a while, five years ago. Um, but yeah, so they're so they're having users exchange time dollars, but the, the actual denomination is ours. And it, it's gone through changes as well. So it could be a really interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. So why, I mean, there's, there are benefits using time dollars too, because I feel right. like if I'm doing it for my own self-interest, right. I feel like I can cash in my time dollars as a virtual bank account, right? Yeah, exactly. Which is good, but it feels more, it's, Perceived as more self-interested, I would hypothesize as a trade-off. Yeah, so, yeah there, have been some, there have been some sort of, yeah, it'd be really interesting to watch like the stirrings within the community as well and how people have reacted to yeah. dollars in the way you would expect based on your the price. Does everyone know what a time bank is? Anyone need an explanation? No idea? Some, can you define a time bank? Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a the, the name is a, evoking the concept of a bank, so you have a bank account where you're registering your exchange of hours. If I walk your dog for an hour, I get an hour of currency, so I get plus one. And then I have that hour that then I can spend on any other thing, like, uh, uh, I don't know, someone else uh, cuts my hair for an hour or half an hour. And, you know, so it's, a, it's a person hour. Yeah, it's a person hour, exactly. And it's sort of uh, the, 
the founder of that particular movement in the U.S. at least. There are sort of predated movements in the U.K. and other, other places, but um, Edgar Khan, who is in D.C., um, sort of had a you know, personal philosophical motivation behind the fact that all hours are equal. You know, like um, no, like no unpaid emotional. Oh, she left. Um, <laughs> No, un no unpaid emotional labor or... What about a book out of the site? No, I don't think so. I don't think Kyle would change the site. Good question. You had a question? I'm Michael, my name is Charlie. Uh, the research you did on, on GoodSwap to me seems like one instance of a general slide of all these sharing economy companies from community peer-to-peer -peer networks into general transactionalism. You see Lyft, for example, uh, you know, started out as pure peer-to-peer -peer ride sharing across cities. These days, it's the company that's competing on price with Uber, Airbnb. Kind of started out like couch surfing, more community sharing. Now it's becoming like a big hotel chain. Uh, Lending Club started out as like a way for retail investors to share money with people who are borrowing. Slide it into a way for institutional investors to basically lend uh, lend money to uh, to individuals. So I I wonder if you think there's the slide into transactionalism is, is inevitable, whether there's some sort of causal forces like underneath all these sharing economy, these economy companies uh, producing this. Um, and I'm also wondering if you think there's any specific instances of sharing economy companies that have kind of prevented, uh, this, like have not slid into transactionalism and have sort of upheld these peer-to-peer -peer, uh, values. Yeah, Charlie, that's a great question. So the, to summarize, He's observing that a lot of sharing economy companies are, as they scale, becoming more transactional, losing their community components. Um, I've observed the same thing. I think Lyft is a great example where the fist bump and sitting in the front seat and the mustache have all gone away largely and they're competing on price. Um, and I've seen that pretty consistently across the space. I, I would conjecture that that's, that's, I taught a class at, or co taught a class at Stanford's Design School last fall called Scaling Sharing. We did a lot of ethnographic research of sharing in different contexts and actually interviewed a bunch of Airbnb hosts. And our conclusion is like we found many ways that sharing happens throughout the world in our day-to-day -day lives and many examples of it. And yet those all were really hard to scale. And the community example I cited at Good Swaps is also challenging to scale, not just because of the currency, but because of some of the other rituals and perceptions and rituals that they have. Um, and part of that is just, it takes a while to get a new member onboarded into your way of thinking, and they may not even be bought into your way of thinking, right? So Lyft wants to grow their market fast, and the people who want to sit in the back seat and be chauffeured somewhere and not have to talk to the driver, like, are probably part of their target market that their investors want them to target, right? And for them to really just, then what comes the financials trade off, and even if they want to target, even though those people are open to the values they're espousing, they have to somehow invite you into those values, get you excited about those values, educate you on those values, and experience and why it's different, and why it's something you enjoy more than anything. And so it's really hard in this world where we're so used to that neutrality of money and transactions, and it's such an easy way for us to slip into any business exchange. It's really hard, especially outside of the um, idealistic early adopters, to scale in a big way and find those people who care or get people excited about it and explain to them why your site is different. So I have yet to find any great examples of other people know of some in the room I'd be fascinated to hear that. Right there. Uh, I don't have any examples, but I was wondering, I mean, in all of the examples we're talking about, but the drive to scale has come from pla platforms to make money off of that which are, right? And I'm wondering if there are examples just about as a different driver behind the desire to scale and whether they fare differently in terms of the transactions and price interviews. Um, well, if you think about couch therapy with recycle, I think those are two interesting examples of sites that are share uh, the forefront of the sharing economy and they have scaled. And you can argue whether or not they're successful at having maintained the core of their values, but they're, they're, they're trying to they're trying to scale in a way that promotes their mission rather than dollars. Does well, that make sense? I don't know about um, recycling one at all, but Calcer, I think that most of the users would say it's when they switch to a core profit model that things start to really go downhill and people lost a sense of community. Yeah. I don't think the reason they went for profit is because the IRS told them they could not be a nonprofit and owe them like $20 million in back taxes, right? So I don't think they, I'm not sure. Yeah. You could argue they lost their mission. I don't think they also had a, a choice because basically the only way they were funding things is a, like a $20, $25 
background check to get onto the site, and that was your donation. The IRS said, actually, that's revenue, and that's all taxable, and suddenly they owed a lot of money to the government. So I'm not sure they lost their mission. I didn't know that I met some of the founders, the CEOs, but not intimately. Um, but maybe it's a perception that they're no longer a nonprofit that changed the way people relate to the site. It's only they saw them as greedy jerks. I don't know. Freecycle has scaled, but they're not super well run. But they're, they've scaled and have a lot. Of, both have a lot of users. So, and I, I would argue are mission driven primarily. I think Couchsurfing is still a, B, uh, a benefit corporation. It's still a B corporation, so the mission is part of it. As is the site I said. So I don't. I, they still have a mission. It's just a trade off between the mission and, and scaling and business model goals uh, back there. One other potential research area uh, which I think might be interesting is just how is technology and those trends actually likely to change our interactions with money in the future to extrapolate that and what that means in the social side of things. So uh, off the top of my head, it seems like money is just disappearing. I mean, transactionally, I deal with money almost not at all anymore. You can deal with money when you get a cab anymore because the cab just turns up and drops you off and you don't deal with money in restaurants so much. You just don't deal with money in life nearly as much. And that's a beautiful thing if you have the normal uh, biases that probably most of us do um, away from money. Um, you know, is that a, a research direction that people are, take, are taking on? Uh, do you have an interest in that question? I think it's an interesting point. The point is that as technology, the technology is letting us see money less and less. It's moving to the background. I think it's a striking example. You hop in a, when I hop in a taxi and the meter starts rolling, I just stare at it. I'm just like, damn, <laughs> damn. Can we get there faster, right? And and now I don't even think about it. And if, and you know, Lyft or Uber, whomever will tell me how much I paid, but I won't even look at it anymore. It's done before. If you're doing Lyft, uh, Uber pool, it's done beforehand. So I think that actually is a really interesting, promising, I don't know if it's an I don't know if anyone's researching that, but it's a promising shift that when money moves to the background, is that making space for us to connect more in different ways in the foreground? I would guess that research would say yes, but that needs to be tested. You, you had your hand up for a while. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of points to make. I'm going to bring this back to the early end. Okay. Jumping off the point there. Um, I've been going to Burning Man for a long time, and I've noticed that the idea of gift economy tends to get lost on a lot of people in the first time. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that you can, the only thing that money can buy you at Burning Man is ice and coffee. That is it. Everything else is. Now the idea of gift, of my question was how do you quantify human value? And the idea of the concept of gift is oftentimes thought of as me giving you something, a material thing. Let's go back to the thing about money. In the absence of money, barter becomes the default response is what I've noticed. People will like to barter for no bars, for using a solar shower or something like that. So, in the absence of money, the human thing is, well, there's got to be value in some things. I'm going to treat this because it's just an automatic response. It's what money has, it's what the market has conditioned us to think. So, quantifying gifts, especially when you talk about time, how do you quantify human value? All right. I volunteer, and I volunteer for a long time as a ranger. What the rangers are, is they are participant first responders, emergency first responders. We are trained to assist participants in the various issues that they have out there in the fire. Everything from where the porta potty is to I am freaking out because my boyfriend wants to kill himself. And we are all trained to address all these issues. Now then, yes, we get something in return for this. I put in enough hours, I get a free ticket. I put in so many hours, I get a staff ticket. But what really drives us isn't that thing that we get back. It's the compassion that we put into what we do. And it's the many hours that we put in is a show of how much we care about this community. How do you put a value on that? I mean, that's, that's where it gets back to the normative piece, right? We say it. When, that's the normative piece. When you've experienced that and that compassion, the benefit of giving, 
it changes the. It dynamic. changes you. It changes what, how you want to show up and relate to people. It's uh, not everybody gets that. They, they don't all get it, but I would say people. Uh, what's beautiful is when virgins will draw people who've been to Bergen for the first time are driving home with you, and they're like think, they're already thinking of what they can give the next year because they receive so much. Which is kind of the, the flip side of that new of reciprocity. If like if you won't take my granola bar, I won't take the, sho the shoes off my feet now. Then I want to do something for someone else. So in the future, one day I may be a ranger too. So it's a different system, and I think it works really well in that context and in other societies too. Compassion. Your compassion, yeah. Compassion I think really we lose compassion with money. I think that's um, not fair. study that sounded really interesting to me is that, that was uh, about how money can actually buy happiness if you spend it on the right thing. There, that was their glib title of their, of their study, but rigorously what they did was give people an amount of money to spend on themselves or to spend on another person and measure the impact that it had on them. And through the study, they found that actually the process of having someone but give to another person had a measurable positive effect that was actually just part of their part of their study on their satisfaction in life that was far better than getting themselves something of that same value. It was, it was interesting how they used used actually scientific study control mechanisms to try to get a quantified view of how much better it is for sense of well-being to be involved in a giving and sharing sort of scenario. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, a study, a study like that, if you've seen that back to the study or not, but it's, it would be an interesting one to look at when comparing uh, a transactional point of view to a more giving point of view. Yeah, absolutely, which is to say money is not inherently just because it, it's associated with these psychological ideas doesn't mean it's inherently bad, right? If you, uh, it, it can be used to create happiness by helping others, um, and there's a lot of research showing that altruism and giving, giving, you know, giving actually is better than receiving, and it does make you happier over the long term and things like that. So that's a whole other great area of research. Not just that kind of game that I've I agree with everything you're saying about the sort of different schemas with which we operate and distancing uh -huh. between schemas, but I actually think the fundamental object isn't so much money as it is the accounting. And in various environments, I've seen things that are very tortured to turn it to, to convert into currencies, converted into currencies because of either one of two dynamics, uh, scarcity or free rider problems, mm -hmm. right? So uh, social connections or number of seats available on a trip or, you know, like weird things that everyone is treating as uh, a kinship good until the schema breaks and somebody hasn't shown up correctly for the tenth time and all of a sudden accounting behavior kicks in and the group starts accounting. So I feel like it's not even about money as money, it's about our fundamental whether or not we're tracking that which we give, that which we get at. Um, like mental bank accounting. Yeah, like there's part of it, right? Uh, sorry? It's like, it's like a, a part of it that goes on in your head. Or you know, just some some okay. form of aggressive process. And, and another way of putting what you're say, saying, what you're saying is that I think money, boiling everything down to money, is the lowest common dominant common denominator. And then what, uh, Michael Sandel, who's a great philosopher, has this book, uh, recent book, um, The Limits of Markets, and basically how everything in our society, from baseball tickets to you know, from, to healthcare costs to helping friends, is really being monetized and dollarized. So we're shifting from relational norms. That govern the, how do you, you know, or a norm ever you stand in the queue to get your place? Well, something I can buy my way to the front of the queue more and more. So, and even a personal relationship that's happening. And uh, and I think that does really change our social fabric and how we have to deal with people. So, there's, there's, there's good work on that too. It's a good point. Eric. Yeah. Um, so, I think that your title that you just referenced reminded me of another book I've read called Limits to Capital, um, which. Did you wrote that? David Harvey. David Harvey goes to capital. Yeah, and uh, and he's coming from probably the extreme left, but um, but he's part of a sort of group of people who are arguing that that as markets and their strength fluctuate, 
uh, informal and more peripheral economies and economic modes um, often take up that slack. And I think you know, there's, there's, uh, the, main, the main sort of argument that I hear for the emergence of sharing economy platforms is that you know, technology has finally come to a place where it can allow us to share. But I think perhaps missing in that argument is the huge economic downturn out of which a lot of informal sharing economy platforms emerged. And, uh, and perhaps a more justifiable um, uh, uh, explanation for why we have seen these uh, sharing economy platforms emerge is that um, the official economy, the formal economy, was in such a uh, bad place. And uh, I guess what that leads me to think about is that um, rather than thinking about just one standard uh, demographic upon which we uh, conduct our studies, perhaps we can look at different populations for whom the market is either doing a service or doing a disservice. I mean, like in, in San Francisco, which is like the most privileged part of the economy right now, probably, uh, maybe sharing economy behaviors are not going to be as strong as they are someplace like Detroit or whatever, or like somewhere where the, the economy never really fully recovered, yeah. you know? No, I think that's absolutely right. And I think there's a distinction between sharing economy platform usage, like am I using Uber versus taxis to get around, right. and actually like sharing behavior sharing culture. and sharing culture. And um, there's a conference a year ago, last May, in San Francisco um, um, called Share, up on by Blues.org. And a big part was actually talking about like, this new sharing thing that, that technology invented. It's been around for a long time, and actually a, a number of people from underprivileged communities talked about how, from places like Detroit and Oakland, talked about how Sharing is just and like, is embedded in their day to day lives, but it works through the social fabric of communities, not necessarily complete strangers, right? Which is sort of what's novel, but what's trying to be innovate now. But it's, it's sharing of resources, there's interdependence. Um, also, lower in income communities see themselves, lower income individuals in the US see themselves as more interdependent, and so more someone from, let's say, um, um, Asia would. and. The, the more educated you are and the higher income you are in the US, the more independently uh, construe yourself and see yourself. So I think there's a lot to be learned from communities in this way. But again, but they're not, I don't know if they, they may, they're not going to be necessarily, well, maybe we can learn things from them that can inform multi billion dollar brands, or maybe that's not the point. Uh, Pascal. Um, did you actually build on that? Related to that. Um, is there a difference between? different types of money in the psychological effect. So for instance, if you are in a lower income community, you're much more often going to be dealing with individual dollars, you're handing over cash, as opposed to if you are very wealthy, you're going to be talking about broad investments very abstractly, saying, oh yes, you know, I have these shares, these shares are doing well, as opposed to, yeah, I got 100 bucks uh, from working overtime, that's great. And it seems like you would expect the other way, where you would expect more pro-social sharing behavior among somebody who's not dealing with the individual currency, uh, like the hard cash. Huh. But it seems like it goes the other way, as opposed to what you guys were yeah. just talking about. That's interesting. I don't know. That may or may not have been studied. Um, they have found that people who are wealthy or have wealthy status symbols are less pro-social and less caring. Right. And there's some famous research in Berkeley where basically people at, who drive Mercedes and more, the more expensive the car, the less likely they are to stop for pedestrians at a crosswalk and just not through that. <laughs> Which is not the same, but related. Um, an interesting nuance of the study that I presented that I didn't share is it's um, how wealthy you feel first changes your perception. So if they prime you to think you're really wealthy, you have abundant wealth, you have all this money, that you have a lot less of that effect is, is weaker than if they prime you to think um, scare, money is scarce, you don't have enough money, and prime you to think about scarcity. So if you have scarcity of money, then the, the, effect, the prime effect is actually stronger, which is interesting. Given governments create and regulate money and currency, I'm curious if you have any ideas about what the implications are from this kind of research for government and government policy. And I can imagine that occurring from anything from even what the design is on currency and money all the way through to what it's called or how it's delivered in the form of uh, money, currency, taxation, school vouchers, food stamps, or even how governments as the bastions of currency think about using currency and money more, more effectively given the research that's happened on uh, in this area. Yeah, I'm not sure if you have on that. I don't know. Um, my initial thought is um, it would be really hard to change perception of the U.S. dollar 
but in some ways the U.S. dollar, it's, it's, like, it's kind of like a sort of in-group, out-group bias. If you have an out-group, you have a group you don't like, then you become a stronger group than if you just are, we're all friends. Like if suddenly, if you're all the red team, you all love each other, you're a much weaker group than if it's the blue team that you're supposed to compete against. So I imagine like smaller colonies, like if I were um, Sweden or like, you know, or, uh, or uh, a, a small country with its own uh, currency would have more room if they can contrast or distance itself from the dollar in some ways than we have in the United States I'm not, or New Zealand. I don't know if you have any ideas. Yeah, no, but, I, but obviously, as you've pointed out in the research, there's huge benefit from governments creating currencies, but there's also a dark side. So at least it opens in my mind the idea of government stepping in and making currency more effective and actually leveraging some of this kind of research in terms of what it means to share and detransactionalize currency and get some of the good stuff while throwing away the bad. I don't know what the answer is. But I would, I would assume that there is, as the bastions of currency, there are something, there is something that government could do. So instead of calling it like a dollar, you call it like a puppy. Well, oh, yeah. we have three New Zealand puppies. And or, or it's curious that the government may, you know, give something uh, effectively, instead of giving currency to buy food, the government gives a food stamp which is, has the equivalent of currency. And I wonder what the, what the, what, what, whether that's just as a, as a means of demeaning the recipient of the stamp rather than the currency as a like negative implication or, or a form of societal resentment of the recipient. Um, I don't know, or maybe it's positive. I think it was. To be honest, I think that the food stamp was originally a, a way to sort of demean people who had to pay in actual physical stamps. And then about, I think, 2008-ish, in this in the US, uh, they switched to the EBT card. Right. So it looks exactly like a debit card, and other than the cashier, no one can tell that you're paying with food stamps. So I think right. there was a certain, like, certainly there was a possibly intentional <laughs> uh, denigration of the people using this kind of assistance, and that I, that I think the government, for better or has recognized that and has attempted to ameliorate that effect. So if we assume for a moment that that was a way to denigrate the recipients through rebranding currency, some, like in a negative context, I'm curious to whether there is the flip side, which is a way for government to understand and ingest this research and use it to actually make currency, taxation, other kind of monetary policy, um, yeah, yeah, quite more positive. I think actually, yeah, like that's touching on a complex issue, which is that I think that I don't really know the literature around this very well, but I know that uh, spending on credit cards is, is very different to spending with cash, and people will uh, spend much more on credit cards, for example, which is why the government slash society really encourages spending on credit cards. Uh, but also the sense of reward that comes from spending on credit cards is very different to the sense of reward uh, spending on cash. And I guess there's a sort of conflict in there, which is that like uh, if cash makes it, if cash feels like the purchase is more valuable, um, there's also a greater sense of loss when you spend the cash. And so there's a sort of inherent conflict between like, do you want your food stamp to feel valuable? That's great. But then when you spend it, you're going to feel really enhanced sense of loss also. You don't think it has any idea. Like any part of it was that the government had an obligation maybe to give these uh, this money or these food stamps for that specific thing. And by doing it in the food stamp, it could only be used for the thing it was meant to be yeah. used for rather than cash. Or, or maybe it's a bit of a light. Like, I have a hard time thinking that there's absolute malicious intent. I think a lot of times sure. well, there's like incompetence or poor communication, but it doesn't usually end up being a group of people sitting around saying, let's do this to totally make them feel bad. I think that, I, I don't think in a case like that, that, that seems uh, like it would have existed as a I think I think what I'm trying to get at is that using different forms of currency for different socioeconomic statuses is going to introduce uh, <coughs> a sort of meta level of inequality and in the psychology of the transaction, which is what we're about. Yeah, absolutely. So our implicit bias is show up in our designs too. And I think the point raised is a good one that, like, to avoid public shame 
and, and status being present, you use the debit card, but that may use to, you may actually think about spending that money, you may treat it with less value or less weight or gravitas because of that as well. I was just thinking, this is not directly answering your question, but I was looking at the dollar bill and just thinking of what's evoked on the imagery, right? I mean, yes, we're honoring and memorializing George Washington, but we're also looking at this man that if you were raised in this country, imbues every good value an American should imbue. As I'm about to spend or use this money, on the back we say, in God we trust, and then we have this that eye watching on us, and there's research showing you know, the eye of God watching on you. Like if there's a coffee pot that says, like, please donate a dollar, every time you have a cup of coffee, you're significantly more likely to put a dollar in it. If there's an eye of God on the picture behind you, <laughs> it's just like God is watching. And so, you know, I'm, the likelihood that a social psychologist talk to a political scientist, talk to someone in the Federal Reserve, is highly unlikely, but we have an intuition for this. And so there are even there are subtle ways that we're trying to evoke at least higher morality in the way our currency is um, designed today. So we should put eyes on our credit cards. <laughs> yeah, maybe actually, yeah, yeah. Or, or some reminder, I mean, the credit card company would have no incentive for you to do that, but <laughs> some reminder or something like that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Who has not asked a question and wants to ask one? Yes. I have a question about uh, social currencies and, and alternative currencies, which is that, um, from one perspective, it seems like your research would suggest that the, the issue, um, if, if we're calling like uh, behaving less communally, if we're, if we're putting a normative judgment on it, to go back to what this guy over here said, um, um, if we're putting a normative judgment and saying that behaving more communally is better, um, it seem, it's hard to tell from your research whether the, what makes people act less communally is like the associations with the dollar or the transactionality, which somebody in the back was, was talking about before, the, the switching into accounting mode. Um, one of the things I wonder about with social currencies and alternative currencies is, would it actually be better, um, in whatever sense of the word better you want to use, if we had more things in life that were treated as a type of currency, like if, um, if my time or if I could use shares in a CSA or community supported agriculture or basically anything else as a transactional asset, would that actually be better um, or would that be much, much worse because we'd be infecting the rest of society with this transactional and like precise quantification aspect? So it's a good question. So I think, I think the first point you're making and understand correctly is that um, the relation that the mere association or presence of, of dollar or money contaminates what could have been, which we've been talking about, contaminates what could have been a more relational or communal kinship based exchange into a more transactional exchange. And the, and the, and the research does suggest that. Right? So the question is if we try to quantify or codify or even a relationship, like if you're, if you're married, a domestic partnership, like, hey, I, I did the housework for three hours. Um, what do I get for it? You know, does that, I think that you're right. I think that does then transactionalize something that's based on implicit relationships. And it's important to that. When I talk about the potlatch ceremonies among Native Americans, these are not their closest kin. These are like neighboring tribes. And, after, and neighboring tribes have been flared, you know, in some ways that it's like a, it's like the US Soviet arms race. We don't need to go to war because we just show up with bigger and bigger Bombs in some ways, like, well, I give you a bigger gift. You give me an even bigger gift, and you know, at some point it may explode or there may be some other resolution. But those are, you know, when it becomes really transactional and really competitive, it's usually not your close kin ties. And so I think there is a risk of um, infecting those relationships. And that's not just my view, number of scholars are thinking about that. There's something really close to the type that somebody had a hypothesis around the behavior of people on social networks with and without numbers. And they actually, I don't believe they did a study that actually tested the results, but they looked at the number of friends and the number of comments from Facebook as an experiment that was about the quantification of social relationships. Mm -hmm. And what did they find? I, as I'm saying, I believe it was an application made based on a hypothesis, it's not a scientific study. Okay. I don't know if they did not scientific studies. Okay. Uh, over here. 
I think one of the important things to consider when looking at diversifying our currencies is whether or not they're interchangeable. If there is some sort of exchange rate between a CSA share and the number of dollars, because if the answer is no, then we're forced to construct additional values, additional meaning around each of those things. Like a CSA share may come with this idea of wanting to be environmentally friendly, and so when you give that to somebody, it carries that meaning, and it carries that intent with it, as opposed to if a CSA share can be converted easily into, say, $20,000. So um, that, that's something I'm very interested in. The uh, specific, I work on a type of technology that would allow a lot more things to be exchanged like that, and that's one of the reasons I wonder about this, is because um, like, the positive vision of, of this sort of interaction would be, I can go to a store and sort of swipe a card or do something with my phone where the money shows up in the, the merchant's account as, dollars or whatever type of asset they want, but it actually, like, in my day-to-day -day life, like, it leaves my account as credits in a CSA share. And so I know I don't hold any dollars whatsoever. I only hold a mixture of CSA share and, I mean, you could get as crazy as you want with gold and Bitcoin and, and all kinds of different things, uh, time bank hours. And any one of those things can be instantaneously converted into the other thing to pay the other person. And so what that would enable for me is being able to hold a variety of assets and get the same kind of reach that you get with dollars today. Um, so you, would, you could enable that kind of market, but then that's the question is like, does that make things better? Because I can use non-dollar assets as um, in the same way I'm used to with only dollars, or is that worse because you take away the community or the other values that you have around it and you reduce it to like it's just another transactional asset? Would it be that different from just having the fact that you invest in multiple currencies in the world? Uh, it, it would already be quite system. different if um, the currencies were like. Um, like the Red Victorian could have its own currency that people that use it, it's totally not not related to the dollar officially. Um, its value is determined by the people who are willing to exchange it for other things, and the the Red Vic can thus like create a currency, create a, that kind of store of value or transactional asset. Um, and that would not be just limited to the U.S. government, the European Union, etc. I, I think your average economist would argue that that happens in every transaction with currencies like the dollar. Like, I'm not sure that I 100% agree with it with, with the average economist, but I think they would argue that when the red big hosts an event and charges an amount of money for a space, or when, when you sell your shirt for $20, on whatever platform it is, by placing the value at twenty dollars, you're somehow saying this is how much uh, the value of this relates to an Uber ride across town, a sack of potatoes, uh, a pizza made at a really great Italian restaurant, or whatever else. Well, and furthermore, those that that value is being determined by the dominant society, and I think that going back to women's work, like traditionally women's work, we have seen over and over again that. Uh, work that is not valued by the dominant society is considered less, uh, lesser in some way. And so, for example, the CSA share wouldn't uh, translate in that kind of economy to, to an even value with uh, a, a piece of Google stock. Because the dominant, sort of, from my very feminist perspective, <laughs> sort of white uh, racist, sort of uh, anti-feminist culture would determine that the CSA is not as valuable. And so I think that type of trade system relies a lot implicitly on dominant okay. cultural assumptions. It also, it also doesn't matter whether you're talking about dollars and cents or any alternative form of exchange. We're all assuming that you have it. Think about it if you don't have it. The sharing economy is worth nothing if you don't have the money or Bitcoin or anything else to give. Yeah. It's not a sharing economy anymore. And so, I like what you're talking about, your idea of that, drawing value out of other things, you know, because for people who don't have money, they, there is no sharing of value. 
but there's value in their humanness. There's something that they can give. And, and the challenge is how do you quantify that? It's a question I asked earlier. But does that not debase the sacredness of their humanness to say, oh, well, you, know, you don't have any money, so I guess you're going to have to sort of sell some of yourself to you? Like no, 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 no. no. Yeah. So, 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 I think, like, a mother certainly yeah. considers herself valuable. Like, she yeah. has value to give to the, her child. Yeah, but would it devalue her if then you said, okay, well, then you've got to cash in some of your motherness? No, here's what, what, it does. Like, here's what I'll say. <laughs> here's what I'll say. Um, First of all, I'm glad you brought up Bitcoins. I think if anyone knows about Bitcoins, it would be interesting to interject those into the room. And um, um, what we do know from the research I presented is I think that once you can translate it into dollars in the marketplace, that really does change it. So if you can, and what I did find in the site is that people had a hard time converting to dollars because somehow like iPods might be worth a lot more in this site or like someone like, like crochet needles were worth less or they're like, you know, I ask people, like, how do you translate to dollars? Some, a few of them, like, had a rough number, plus or minus, and had a lot. So, you know, it's just hard because things don't, if I, this item might be, you know, one to ten, this might even be one to five. So, you just have a rough feel for what's right with this currency. So, I think if you're going to develop an alternative currency, you're trying to create this whole other thing. Um, it's hard to value things, but once you start pegging it to the dollar, it's too easy for people to default back to that. You really need to distance yourself from the dollar for, I think, to get the other effects you're looking for. The problem is that money represents power and that money represents lack of power. And I, especially, you know, the woman back over there, I, I really hear your point. I really do. Because it is absolutely disempowering from your point of view. And it doesn't matter what the exchange is. You know, if you're, if you're not have the ability to empower yourself in some way, You'll never be equal. Can I ask a related question to this all super interesting discussion? You mentioned alternative currencies when you were talking about the unity of groups between competitors. So the red group is less unified if they don't have the blue group to compete with. Yes, certainly. And I don't I didn't know the I'm pretty new to the Bay Area, so I didn't know the list of alternative currencies, but were any of those like college or university currencies? And I'm wondering if there's a study about how the buy-in to that alternative currency works, given that there is some sort of implicit, like, us against the neighboring school type of uh, thing happening. And I just didn't, I don't know if any of those currencies were some sort of... Those are not college currencies. They're more communities. You could argue that Bolinas and Fairfax and other lovely but privileged communities in Marin County <laughs> I could comp compete against one another <laughs> in some way. <laughs> um, but uh, I, you would argue that if you wanted people to buy into alternative currency system, that was a way of showing school's pride, and you were at Stanford and trying to juxtapose it to Berkeley, then yes, you would see people be more likely. I guess you need a motivation with these alternative currencies. One motivation could be competition. And competition with that, the in-group, out-group thing, like, I am part of this group, and so I care more about being part of this group because we don't like that group. It's, it's just called sad or practical truth of human nature. So I think that could be, these other psychological ideas like that could be applied to making these systems take off more. Great. Anyone know anything about alternative currencies or Bitcoins or anything like that that they want to share? Negative interest currencies. Say more about negative interest currencies. So like, if the, if the Fed or like the ECB right, lowered the interest rate to like below zero percent, you know, uh -huh. so that actually means, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it basically means that like any money that you have in your bank account just disappears over time, right? So a negative interest rate of ten percent, you have a thousand dollars in your bank account, you're just gonna lose like you know money over time. Like in my opinion, like that is a potential like solution for redesigning a currency um, that sort of instantiates values of community, or at the very least, instantiates values that are not pure self-interest. Because like, hyper, like my hypothesis is the reason that dollars activate this brain system of you know, self-interest and competition is because when I make a financial transaction, I'm operating out of a worldview of surplus value. Like if I'm paying you money to do something for me, mm -hmm. I'm doing it because I think that I'll get more value from me than I'll lose by giving you the money, right? There's a mm -hmm. surplus value. Right? That's kind of, you know, that's, that's how transactions work. But with a negative interest rate, any money that I own will just deplete over time. It's like having a hoarding tax. Will the government? Uh, so 
you could, I mean, you could influence it. Uh, let's let's say that we, we hooked everyone on the currency. You could implement but physical assets that you have in your own, and therefore you can just translate any electronic currency into a physical asset, and that would be the dominant savings. Okay. But the size of it. Size of it. It basically makes money reflect the actual characteristics of actual physical assets, which do deteriorate, like entropy exists. Yeah. So I think it's an inflation figure that, like, if you yeah. have inflation, but interest rates don't rise or something like that. Yeah, I guess it could, but like then you get price increases, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just saying, well, but sorry, because doesn't inflation and price increases actually cause the money in your bank to lose value over time, right? Yes. Okay. Like, isn't that already the reality of yes. our economic system? Yeah, that's true. I guess I'm proposing, like, you know, if we have like a, a totally global tax on all kinds of capital, like, money is. Well, you want to propose a system, I might have a couple no, of it, it, no, I, but, no, but, but specifically, if, if the currency itself were taxed, like if there was like a, a tax, like a like a tax on holding currency, on hoarding and holding currency, that would like produce additional incentives to give the money away. Basically, I think it would just increase the black market for the land. And it wouldn't be a black. I, I just think it would be the same kind of economy, right? Because people would have more assets, which people today have more. They'd be really sure and they would be smart about it. They'd hire somebody to make sure they're always buying things so that they have more things than other people. Maybe, maybe you'd have to like tax all assets as well. <laughs> the interesting thing we all are talking about is, is the embedded assumptions around the current market model, which is that I put money in the bank, it increases, it, it, I trust the money will still be there, right? I don't trust in the gold standard or silver standard anymore, I trust in God. <laughs> Because, like, I eat the Federal Reserve. <laughs> um, because, and, um, and I trust that it will create interest over time. But when you lose that belief, you look what happened with the Euro and Greece, you look what's happening in China right now, the fact that we haven't had real interest rates since 2008, it calls into question this current system. And one called the dark scenario is it collapsed into Russia and black markets, right? And that becomes the world and we're very fragmented. You can imagine. Suddenly, that makes a really practical case for these simple currency, currency alternative systems, borrowing systems, ideas that some people this room have proposed to maybe actually be a more logical, rational, value adding system. I don't know what those look like yet. Well, but deeper, deeper to this point, I'm wondering if, like, more fundamentally, can you imbue, like, are there different ways to design a currency that imbue different values in them? Like, that, that invoke different sorts of psychological reactions? To a currency, and has anyone researched? You know, if you if you make it uh, a deflationary currency in its very nature, or if you put pictures of happy pigs on the cover, currency like do, are there ways to design currencies differently to make them evoke different sorts of psychological? Um, I, I think what you're talking about is almost priming through currency or being really yeah. social media. Yeah, so, so Zelizer and some of the, some researchers would say yes, and traditional societies have done that, and even women in the mid 1800s in, in domestic partnerships have done that. Um, so people have done that. We haven't seen a lot. Of it was not as much around, but there hasn't been a lot in our modern society. It would be interesting to see innovation around that. I'm just kind of wondering. Okay, I'm going to suggest that maybe we wrap up and carry the conversation on over drinks, but I'm going to let Michael. Okay. Yes, anyone, this is good because people are talking yeah. to each other. Right? Uh, so, one other thing is that, uh, so something that's happened a few times in our events is where there's a number of group of people who are particularly interested in a topic, uh, they run with it and form a subgroup who meet more regularly. So, that's happened with our um, justice system topic and utopia topic. So, if anybody here is interested in like, having a more regular meetup, then Evan has suggested that you might be interested in collecting email addresses. Uh, so, definitely do that. Uh, I'm definitely not kicking everyone out. I would encourage you to carry on having a drink and having a conversation, but I'm going to let Michael escape and uh, say thank you so much. <laughs>
actual characteristics of actual physical assets which do deteriorate, like entropy exists. Yeah, so I think well, you put so inflation I, take care of that? Like if you yeah. have inflation, but interest rates still rise or something like that? Yeah, I guess it could, but like then you get price increases, right? Mm -hmm. Like, well, but sorry, but doesn't inflation and price increases actually cause the money in your bank to lose value over time, right? Yes. Okay. Like, isn't that already the reality of yes. our economic system? Yeah, that's true. I guess I'm proposing like, you know, if we had like a, a totally global tax on all kinds of capital, like money is... Well, if you want to propose a new global system, I might have a couple no, of no, things. No, but, but, but specifically, if, if the currency itself were taxed, like if there was like a, a tax, like a, like a tax on holding currency, on hoarding and holding currency, that would like produce additional incentives to give the money away, basically. I think it would just increase the black market for the land. And <laughs> It wouldn't be a black, I, I think it would be the same kind of economy, right? Rich people would have more assets, rich people today have more assets. Well, they'd be really sure and they would be smart about it, they would hire somebody to make sure they're always buying things so that they have more things than other people. Maybe, maybe you'd have to like tax all assets as well. So I think what we all are talking about is, is the embedded assumptions around our current market model, which is that I put money in the bank, it increases, it, it, I trust the money will still be there, right? I don't trust in the gold standard or silver standard anymore. I trust in God, because, <laughs> like, I need the Federal Reserve. <laughs> um, because, and, um, and I trust that it will create interest over time. But when you lose that belief, you look what happened with the euro and Greece, you look what's happening in China right now, the fact that we haven't had real interest rates since 2008, it calls into question this current system. And one called the dark scenario is a collapse into Russia and black markets, right? And that becomes the world, and becomes very fragmented. But you can imagine suddenly that makes a really practical case for these some alternative currency, alternative systems, borrowing systems, ideas that some people in this room have proposed to maybe actually be a more logical, rational, value-adding system. I don't know what those look like yet. Well, but deeper, deeper to his point, I'm wondering if, like, more fundamentally, can you imbue, like, are there different ways to design a currency that imbue different values in them, like that? that evoke different sorts of psychological reactions to a currency and has anyone research, you know, if you if you make it uh, a deflationary currency in its very nature, or if you put pictures of happy pigs on the cover of currency, like, do, are there ways to design currencies differently to make them evoke different sorts of psychological? Uh, I, I think what you're talking about is almost climbing through currency or being yeah. social media. Yeah, so, exactly. so Zelizer and some of the, some researchers would say yes, and traditional societies have done that, and even women in the mid 1800s in, uh, in domestic partnerships have done that. Um, so people have done that. We haven't seen a lot. It was not as much around, but there hasn't been a lot in our modern society. Yeah. It would be interesting to see innovation around that. I'm just not worried about. Okay, okay. Oh, I'm yeah. going to uh, suggest that maybe we wrap up and carry the conversation on over drinks, but I'm going to let Michael. Okay. Yes, anyone... this is good because people are talking yeah. to each other in our uh, So one other thing is that, uh, so something that's happened a few times in our events is where there's a group of people who are particularly interested in a topic, uh, they've run with it and formed a subgroup who meet more regularly, so that's happened with our um, justice system topic and utopias topic. So if anybody here is interested in like, having a more regular meetup, then Evan has suggested that you might be interested in collecting email addresses, uh, so definitely do that. Uh, I'm definitely not kicking everyone out. I would encourage you to carry on having a drink and having a conversation, but I'm going to let my escape and uh, say thank you so much. <laughs>